got a lot of uh, information here for you um, to unravel the grain and hay industry. Um, big picture stuff, small picture stuff, um, trying to peel away the onion to sort of see how this thing does work. Um, I'm going to tell you my conclusions up front and then you'll work out why I've told my con mentioned these conclusions. But um, I reckon grain markets are pretty well priced at the moment. Uh, there is some upside but there is some hope that that may be exaggerated and it might tend to come back a little bit. With the hay markets, um, they've, uh, they're also incredibly high as you, everyone well knows, um, but I think there is probably going to be some harvest pressure to be borne with the volume of hay that's come on the market and um, beyond that it's going to be pretty much what happens in New South Wales that will determine the Victorian hay price. But um, to kick things off, this little pink um, blob down here, which is the temperatures that occurred Saturday night in um, the great southern area of Western Australia, that has really turned the Victorian grain market on its head because we are dependent on what happens in Western Australia now. This is the source of grain to keep Eastern Australia going. And um, some reckon that that knocked a million tonnes off the Western Australian crop. That may, be, that may prove to be an exaggeration, um, but um, there is a lot of concern for, uh, for the grain crop in WA <coughs> and um, it bucks up our prices accordingly. So that, just for the sake of the graph here, that is uh, between zero and minus three last Saturday. And, that, of course, is replicated um, s Saturday night and Sunday night throughout, um, throughout central west New South Wales and the Riverina as well. But uh, just on the, on the big picture stuff for grain, um, these are the uh, tonnages of uh, wheat that were produced in Western Australia and South Australia uh, this year. Well, that's what the prediction is and, and um, that's what we reckon is going to be coming from the east coast. You can see um, normally 16-17 we're nearly balanced. Um, the current season east coast was slipping below and, um, and this current projection, this is ABARES numbers, um, east coast projections are way down and Western Australia is having a pretty damn good season relatively. So. Um, that is meaning that there's a massive deficit here that has to be filled from, um, from SA and, uh, and WA. And a lot of that grain is uh, coming around the coast, Albany, um, uh, Quinana, uh, Port Lincoln, they're all pouring into um, Newcastle, Brisbane and even Port Kembla down south as well. Um, barley's got a similar situation as well, again a, a big deficit uh, this year compared to the, the last few years and particularly the long five year average as well. So normal trade flows, well normally the big picture stuff again, grain in Victoria is just priced what it takes to put it on a truck, get it down to Geelong or Melbourne, stick it on a boat and get it to the biggest grain markets that we feed into Indonesia. And we price ourselves off whatever the Indonesian market is. Indonesian market is set by normally what it costs to get our competitor grain from the Pacific Northwest of the US to compete with us there. Increasingly, it's the Black Sea market that comes in and they set the price. Comes all the way from there, Kazakhstan and Russia, and they are competing actively with us to get our grain into, uh, into our key markets. That's how it normally works. These days, what we're looking for is the price is set by what it takes to put grain in a B double and send it up to Tamworth or Dolby into those feedlot markets up there. And that price is actually set from what it costs to replace that grain with grain out of Western Australia. And it comes in by truck, it's sold free on truck Brisbane, and it's sent out to the Darling Downs and down to Tamworth from there. And accordingly, the price for Western Australian grain is then set from those normal trade flows from, from international markets. So, 
So it's not as if we're currently totally divorced from the world market. If the world market goes up, WA goes up, then we go up. But it's an entirely separate step. These, these trade flows are, never happened before. It's, it's weird. So how expensive is grain in Australia currently? These are Victorian prices. I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to graphing grain and I just always like a picture. But this is um, how much, how high is Victorian grain compared to the Chicago futures in the US? Normally, um, whoops, there we go. Normally, um, we'd be hovering about a $50 premium. Um, recently, we got up to 143. Um, yesterday, our ASX futures market went up another $26 a tonne from the Friday close. So. We are stratospheric as far as this is concerned. We are in uncharted waters. This says, do not export grain from Eastern Australia. We need every grain we need. And that's exactly what's happening. So it's just staying where it is. We are way out of the export market, and um, which is exactly what it should be doing. So um, big picture supply picture for the world here. Um, recently, this uh, represents how many days of grain we have in store at any one time. And we're now looking here at, um, the blue line is barley stocks. And you can see the world supply for barley stocks in the last few years, last three years, has fallen off from about 70 days down to about 55 days. So this, they're getting tight and you can relate the stocks with prices, they correlate very well. You get tight stocks, your prices go up. It's a really direct relationship. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, you're also seeing corn, dramatic drop off in stocks in corn, and wheat recently has started dipping down as well. So these are all not good signs. If you're a grain buyer, these are not good signs because the world supply situation is becoming very tight. And that's that is impacting recently as this week, the Chicago prices are reacting to exactly this. Um, scenes you've probably seen yourself, but uh, car warp crops here in, uh, in late August. Uh, a lot of that, uh, a lot of these pictures are above Dale's line of shite, as he's calling it, agreeing with him on that one. Um, Ultima. Uh, again, probably not a, it's an early sown crop, looking quite okay, but um, wouldn't have done much since, uh, since later August. Uh, Birchip, heavier country, um, really struggled to get much um, hay or grain off a lot of that country this year. That's going to be dismal. Further south, Kalki, just north of Horsham, early barley crops, they'll get some, they'll get some decent yields. May not be average, but they'll get, they'll get decent crops there. Um, so, what's it mean on price? Um, the Melbourne delivered price for, this is like a GP, ASW, largest volume of wheat that trades. Um, massive spikes here back in the drought, but um, they also coincided with some massive spikes in world markets as well. There was, you may remember, there was um, some bans put on exports out of, the, out of the Black Sea. And so that caused massive scares and supply scares in the world. And, um, and we've had those uh, coinciding there. But um, <clears throat> this is the big record year we had in 2016. Uh, incredibly high yields, um, massive surplus, massive supply carryover, a big export burden. And, um, and then we've got this year. So uh, just touching on canola meal, the um, canola meal prices, which are a very big imp component for the protein com supplies for the dairy job. Uh, it's off the charts now, very difficult to buy uh, old crop at all. Uh, new crop supplies will be getting incredibly thin, of course, because of the number of canola crops that are being cut for hay now. Um, I think the... Uh, Going forward, you're going to be looking to price your protein components off the, um, the soybean meal complex in the US. This is US soybean meal prices. Fortunately, they've been coming down lately. Trump's uh, trade war with China means that um, 
the US has got a lot of uh, soy products wanting to go somewhere. You may not necessarily use soy meal in your, in your pellets and your rations that you use for dairy, but it will be priced off this anyway. So all the protein complex will price off this. So the bullish side for, uh, for the grain, uh, we have declining stocks, so that's going to keep the big picture fairly tight. The Aussie crop is not in the bin yet, so um, there still is a way to go. We need to make sure that that does get there. Um, you'd, you'd, there is support from some feedlot sectors to actually continue to pay for grain at these prices. It is, they are making money. Um, lamb feedlots in particular. But uh, on the bearish side of things, if you're a positive half glass full kind of guy, um, you would look at all the bad news is already in the market. It's already priced in. Um, the prices, the function of the market is to shrink the demand when the prices are high and that's exactly what's going to happen now. Um, so in a world market situation, the world is getting much better at managing lower stocks. So that relationship that I was talking about between tight supply and high price may not be as, as close as you might imagine. Um, and fortunately, we do have stocks in Western Australia. You know, the droughts we had back 06, 07, 08, that wasn't the case. They were national droughts. We had to bring in US corn and, and UK feed wheat and go through all those biosecurity things. But we've got our own homegrown supply st stocks now, which is, which is fortunate. So uh, the other thing, if you are looking to create a positive story and think the prices are going to go down for grain, um, that the frost story may have been overstated. They may get more grain than they thought they did. And no one can answer that until you actually get the headers in the paddocks. Is that WA you're talking about? That's WA I'm talking about and, 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 West, and New South Wales and Victoria, yeah. But Western Australia is the big picture. That's, that's the ultimate determinant. So, hey markets, I'm hoping I've got about 10 minutes to go, Rob. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Even uh, a little bit longer. Even a bit longer, right. Um, it's all about New South Wales. That has that really set this market on its head. Um, and uh, New South Wales has got all these hungry green lines here, which are their road train routes. And uh, just for the sake of the map, they've got Mildura up here. Um, where are we? I can't even see myself. Um, Marabit here, Swan Hill, Tulibuck. So your Murray is going along here. So you've got all these green lines trying to draw on the hay with road train routes sucking hay out of Victoria. <coughs> um, that's been matched by road train routes in New South in Victoria. We've never had road trains for a, a big chunk of Victoria, but increasingly we've got this snake now from um, Oyen coming down to Beulah, which is a road train route. Incredibly efficient. These things can take hay. At, uh, they take off 25% of the cost of hay um, and it can really be a very efficient way of long haul freight for, for hay. <coughs> so you've got these the bridges across the Murray that are going to be taking hay across and they, and they have been doing this for the last 12 months and they will continue for the next 12. Um, taking grain out of Victoria into New South Wales. That, that market is going to continue to suck grain out. I estimated about 400,000 tonnes went from Victoria last year out of Vic, about the same out of, New South, out of South Australia going up into New South and Queensland. So they've got a big appetite. Um, the hay situation in Victoria, it's murky and I'm trying to sort of peel off the layers of the onion just to show you how it works. But the green line here is pasture hay production in Victoria. You've got this orangey one here, which is the cereal hay. Um, silage is up top. Um, you've got lucerne and a few other things tucked in here. But the, the bulk of the, there's two things to take out of this graph. That the bulk of the hay is pasture hay. 
but a good chunk of it is the cereal hay. And of all of the hay that's traded, as you well know, part the cereal hay is the thing that invariably is the thing that you buy when you buy hay. So the future of the market rests in the supply of cereal hay, not so much pasture, because pasture generally stays on the farm of, from which it was produced. It doesn't move. But your price is determined by the, the fortunes of cereal hay. So this graph just pretty much says that. Of total Victorian crop of about just under 3 million tonnes, 15, 16 being an average year, um, a massive amount of pasture hay, but about a quarter cereal hay, which sets the price. Um, of that, and the point of this graph is that most of the pasture hay that we grow in Victoria comes from south of the Great Divide, Karangamai, Glenelg, Hopkins, and, um, and this bloke over here. So between those three, they're more than a third of the pasture hay production in Victoria. So if you're again a positive thing looking at the hay market, you'd say they're having a crackerjack season down there. Some of them have been too wet. So you'd say pasture hay in southern hay as they can, silage, some of them get two bites of the cherries, silage then hay. So that's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting to keep the demand happy for, for hay in Victoria. This is your hay graph um, and um, it's a bouncy one. It's much more volatile than the hay, the grain one I showed you before. Shows the big drought in, in 023. The massive droughts we had six to eight. Um, another a few more dry springs out here. But this spike that we've had recently is unprecedented. We are record prices for hay. We've never been here before and uh, it, you sort of wonder where it's all going to end. Um, big reasons for all the spikes previously, water allocations interestingly have played a big part. The GV has been drawing in hay throughout these times here, setting the scene. This has been the epicentre for where hay demand has needed to be. National droughts have made it difficult. Dry springs have also cut back the um, the, uh, the the hay, the pasture hay side of things. And uh, pulling prices back again, incredibly wet seasons, the uh, record year of hay that we had in 2016, the 2010 wet year, big years where you had two years worth of hay stored virtually coming in from one year to the next. So it's a lot of hay stock sitting around. That has tended to dampen the enthusiasm of hay from a lot of grain growers perspective. They, they don't like hay sitting around. They uh, just like the idea of getting cash flow, tip it in the grain silo, get my money 30 days end of week. Thank you very much. But you can't do that with hay. A lot of mucking around. And so that's given them a bad taste. So I wanted just to show you this graph here, which puts grain and hay on the same graph. And what it tells me is that that um, hay is much more um, bouncy in a way. It has bigger dips. And I would argue that here, hay stayed cheap for too long. And hay prices only started really ratcheting up until April, May this year. And um, my argument would be that that gave a lot of people false hope in a way. They set up their businesses believing that they'll be able to buy hay at $150 a tonne, ex farm Victoria, right through spring, right to spring this year. And they borrowed money accordingly, got themselves up for it, kept their breeding stock in New South Wales, and then it all caught up with us. And there was not enough grain, uh, rather hay to go around. And it's just been ratcheting up ever since. We've never seen a spike in hay prices like that. Um, and the market would have been much better had it, and we would not see prices anywhere near where they are now, had those prices been higher back earlier on. I'm 
that's, no one can ever prove me wrong. I can say this because no one can ever prove me wrong. But that, that, that's what I believe would, would be the deal there. Um, Vetch Hay uh, is somewhere up a little bit, obviously, a premium to, uh, to what's happening with, um, with the cereal hay. Generally, a $50 premium for Vetch Hay. You can pretty much kiss Vetch Hay goodbye. It's, again, above uh, Dale's line of shite. Um, but fortunately, uh, we've got this stuff. And this is a, a paddock of canola hay, which was um, just cut over the weekend. Uh, huge areas of canola hay being cut. Um, and uh, I think this is going to be the good news story for uh, particularly the dairy sector. Um, it's, it's got a lot of good attributes. It's, you know, of 700 different lots sampled back in 2008, the protein average for canola hay was 15. Um, a lot of people know, believe it to be closer to 18 to 20, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty handy source of feed. Oh, will we get the better proteins this year because of wine early rather than late? That's exactly right. We, I think the grain growers now are getting much better at firstly making canola hay, but they're making the decision much earlier to cut canola hay this year. Um, so that the, they're, they're very fleshy, they're mid-flower, they're not late pod fill. You're trying to avoid those thick stems. You don't want them the size of your thumb. You want them less than your little finger. You know, you, do, you don't want wastes. And um, I think a lot of them, if they do have early crops that are well matured, they'll probably be cutting them not beer can height, which is typical, but they might be going a bit higher to get the quality. I think it's going to be bloody competitive for these guys to sell that volume of, um, of uh, canola hay. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of it. Um, these are my ballpark guesstimates. Again, all the districts in Victoria. This is the ABARES area figure for um, and, and production rather for, um, for canola in Victoria. Of and that's the proportions that are in each of those areas. The proportions, I'm guessing, are going to be cut for hay. A big chunk in um, around Elmore, Rochester, Dookie, Tungama, a lot are going to be cut up there. And some decent yields too around in the northeast. They've been on the cusp of those alpine rainfalls. They're having a reasonable, reasonable season of it, although it's cut off since. But They'll, um, they'll get some reasonable yields for their, their hay. So I reckon a couple of hundred thousand tonnes of canola hay for Victoria will go down very nicely and it's probably what you would expect to get from vetch hay as well. So that's, a, that's one to look out for. Um, your nutritionist might be talking to you about uh, nitrates and, uh, and uh, the stem thickness and waste. Suits feed um, pads and uh, mixer wagons pretty well if you can incorporate it and not have it as a sole feed. But um, it's, it's going to be a pretty valuable asset, I think, for, for the industry. Um, on the cereal hay, these are the percentages of production you would normally expect to have cereal hay produced in Victoria. So a lot of it in this Lod and Compassby area here uh, the Wimra, right through into the GV, not so much the Mallee. Um, interestingly, my, um, my line of shite line, line is not too dissimilar to, um, to Dale's. Uh, these are the areas where I reckon the key growing areas where you'll be able to buy cereal hay. A lot of these areas through here just don't have the biomass to justify cutting for hay. Um, you know, in, even, even through this sort of birch of central Mallee, northern Wimra area, they're going to be struggling to, to get anything half decent. And, but interestingly, a lot along the border here, you know, Japarit, Rainbow, right down to Neil Caniva, there's some pretty handy hay crops down through there. Um, so my, uh, my predictions on, on how much hay we're going to have, Green bars here is how much pasture hay you'd have in a decent year in Victoria. Um, and this is cereal hay. A decent year here is the green. I reckon you're going to have sensational 
um, volume of cereal hay this year in Victoria. It's going to be much better than normal. Um, other crops, you know, you get a, other, other broad acre crops being cut for hay. So silage about average because you've got a lot of the southern areas doing quite well in silage. I think um, a lot of silage crops here, even the, in the GV, are well set up as well. So above average production this year, but you're going to need it because you've got next to no carry in, Every, the, 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 the cupboards are bare and uh, you've got this monster in New South Wales still sucking tonnage out of Victoria. So you're going to need to, uh, you need all of this to keep Victoria going plus what's happening in New South Wales. So to summarise the scene for the hay, you're going to have more crops to be cut. Western districts looking good for hay. Um, the hay price is driving up demand. You know, you've got a lot of grain growers that really don't want to be cutting their crops. They're, 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 they're on the earth to grow grain, but the, <clears throat> the numbers are just stacked against them. They've got to cut their crops for hay. It just makes all the sense in the world. So they'll be cutting their crops. WA season, if they've got big crops over there, that will help feed grain, at rather hay, into their export sector. Take a little bit of sting, maybe, out of the exporters over here, because a lot of them have got footprint in both states. So that's, um, that could work well just to keep these guys happy. So how much is New South Wales going to buy this year? You know, a lot of those graziers in Western New South Wales were buying hay since October last year. You know, they've been going nearly 12 months. How long can they keep going? You know, they've got to scale back as much as they can. How long can they continue to borrow money to support their breeders? You know, there's going to be some harsh decisions to be, to be made and I question how much more they can, can they continue to buy. And uh, the other thing is uh, the question I'm putting here, maybe you know, there's going to be every incentive to grow summer forage crops with irrigation water, but there's some issues with water that I don't understand that people here will. Um, and I would argue that dairy farmers now are much more resilient um, than they were 10, 20 years ago, much more self-reliant, see, can see what's going to happen and um, have set themselves up. So I think um, that's probably a just as well. On the bullish side of things, New South Wales does have a massive appetite for hay. They still have these massive road trains taking grain out of the Mallee and Wimmera. Um, and uh, we still need to get a break next autumn to make sure that we can get reasonable hay supplies right through winter next year. So there's, it's a many different cogs in the wheel there. Um, we have incredibly low carrying stocks, as I mentioned. Valley Mitch, the, the Mallee Vetch, is pretty much gone. So currently, new crop hay prices, Central Mallee 300x farm, that's what the brokers are buying it for, taking it up into New South Wales. Hay exporters are matching that, they have to, um, but it's a little bit lower in. Um, in the Elmore, Rochester, perhaps back a little bit from that, but still quite high. This is new crop prices. So that's probably, and it's nominal, but 350, 340 X farm would be a representation of a prompt X farm price. So it is, it is back, but um, potentially that might come back more because the frosts have changed the game. And the weekend frosts mean there'd be a lot more hay cut than there was going to be before. So I, I can see some pressure coming on these prices by the time you get into late October, early November. That's my patch, Rob. What's the main mechanism with um, hay coming from down south? Is it, how much of it's sort of farmer to farmer and how much of it's through brokers and how does that, how does that sort of trade work normally? Uh, it's surprising how much is um, farmer to farmer. A lot of the farmers are really well set up. They've got massive sheds, they've got truck themselves. They're, and a lot of them operate as, as quasi brokers as well. So 
I would say the majority of the hay would be done that way, but um, probably not far behind our brokers. There's a lot of brokers that are doing it, and it's that's a competitive field. Um, you know, Feed Central, Murray Goldman Trading. You know those, or now Saputo. You know they're all out there taking taking hay up there. So your, the question is, can you find the brokers, can you find a market for your hay, is that the question? No, 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 for, to, to, to buy the hay if you want to buy hay. Oh, if you're situated up here, how do you find those people? I sure you okay okay um, well a lot of the dairy farmers my understanding is that they have long-term relationships buying hay and it, if they can't buy it from their normal um, hay grower they invariably buy it from their neighbor it's it's a it's a word of mouth thing that that is very much an, a larger majority within Victoria would be farmer to farmer trade for sure yeah, which which makes it an interesting market because it's not centralised at all. It's and there's there's no standards as such, so it, it is a an opaque market for sure. Um, the current spike in hay prices, how, uh, there's obviously demand up north keeping breeders alive. What effect do you think media and buy bail campaigns have had on that? Not a good one. No. <laughs> a, no. I, I'm, Is it going to, it should drop off in time when interest in the city drops away, do you think? Possibly. Um, but I think the, the media has really latched onto this story and they've seen its popularity in the city. And if there's a drought story, they're going to put it on because they know it works, you know, that'll continue. I don't think the media is, the, the, the metro media is not going to drop it, put it that way. Yeah. It's going to continue. I think it's going to continue and, and you know, the, the whole freight subsidies, charities competing against legitimate buyers, I, I think it's ugly. I think it distorts the market, it's wrong.